Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for a conversation this morning about building codes and affordable housing. We'll get started in just a few moments as we allow for people to join this morning's conversation. Just as a reminder, we can see you or we can see you can see us, but we cannot see you. But you're a key part of the conversation this morning. So even though we can't see you, we hope that you will participate in this morning's conversation and that you will go ahead and uh, participate by joining the chat. The chat should be open now for everyone to tell us what your name is, where you're from, share anything that you're interested in learning about building codes today. A couple other things to note, we will be recording this forum and sending out a link to the recording to everyone who registered. And we will get started in just one moment. Oh, great. It's great to see people popping into the chat. So we know we know that we're not just shouting into the void, but that you all are active participants in the conversation as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this online forum discussing building codes and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. My name is Serena Unrein, and I'm with the Arizona Partnership for Healthy Communities, which is managed by LISC Phoenix. We are co-hosting today's forum with the Arizona Housing Coalition. And today you'll be hearing from three expert panelists as they discuss how building codes play an important role in regulating health and safety, but sometimes can serve as a barrier to increasing the amount of available housing units which is a really important conversation in Arizona. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. A few things to note before we get into the conversation. Once, once again, you can see us, but we cannot see you, but you are a key part of the conversation. So please drop your name into the chat, ask any questions that might come up about building codes. I will do my best to make sure that we get to as many conversations and questions that the audience will be bringing up in the chat as we can today. We'll be wrapping up at 11.15 and time always flies by. So if I don't get to all of your questions, I apologize in advance, but you are a key part of the conversation. Finally, we will be recording this forum and sending out the link to everyone who registered registered today. So please feel free to share this conversation with your friends and colleagues. I'll now introduce our three panelists and get to our questions. We have William Osborne, who is a city planner in Douglas, Arizona. We have Christian Solario, who is an architect with the Architectural Resource Team. And we have Pat Watts, who is co-founder and partner at Greenlight Communities. We'll go ahead and start with the basics. Uh, how does the building code process work? What all do building codes entail? Who writes them? Who enforces them? And how do each of you interact with building codes in your work? I'll go ahead and start with Pat, if you want to kick us off and tell us a little bit more about building codes. Thank you. I'm Pat Watts. I'm with Greenlight Communities. And just a bit of background, a Greenlight builds attainable rental housing. We've been doing that exclusively for five to six years. We build throughout most municipalities in Phoenix. We build in Tucson as well, in Pima County, in Pinal County, and we build the same type of product over and over again. So we're really a, a really good sort of laboratory laboratory for how different cities look at the, exactly the same product. And Serena, thank you for inviting me. And I said to my husband, this is the most interesting, boring topic that you're ever gonna hear about, which is building code. And if uh, your question was, what are building codes? So I brought a, you can see it. This is the international building code. This, this is what defines how, not what we can build, but how we can build it to keep it safe. That's most of what the International Building Code does. Layered on top of the International Building Code are all of the other codes that various cities may put in place, zoning regulations, stipulations, and how we interact with it is every time we have a project that we need to build, we need to comply with every page in here and about 10 times as much that the city puts on top of it. Thanks, Pat. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to someone who can share a city perspective. 
William, can you tell us a little bit more about building codes and how you interact with building codes? Sure. <clears throat> As the city planner for the city of Douglas, um, I also manage uh, building uh, the building department or the building division. And so with what we do is we first look at uh, compliance with our zoning regulations, the codes, um, as far as what can be uh, located where and how much of it. Uh, but when you get into the building codes, that's the next step in our review for development permits is that gets actually quite specific as well in terms of minimum requirements uh, with an eye towards safety and, and and the health of the occupants. But as suggested in your introduction, uh, some of the requirements almost uh, shadow or copy the zoning regulations. So even if we were to discuss uh, abolishing zoning, um, the building codes kind of effectively uh, regulate what you can do and where and how much of it as well. That's my short answer. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll get into the long answer this morning. So thanks, William. And, and Christian, Christian, do you want to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and how you interact with building codes and anything that you can share uh, to enlighten us about how the process works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, everyone, my name is Christian Solari. I'm an architect. I specialize in building affordable housing. Um, and that's throughout the whole spectrum of affordability from non-congregate shelters to congregate shelters to tiny homes to modular homes, homes for first-time home buyers in the form of townhomes, in the form of single-family homes, duplexes, um, small multifamily apartments and large multifamily apartments, and um, working to serve lots of different specialty populations, including victims of domestic violence, seniors, veterans, people with severe mental illnesses, um, and um, families, um, and, and many more, um, and throughout the entire state. So working in Kingman, Page, Flagstaff, Tucson, Phoenix, Mesa, Glendale, Cottonwood, um, getting to work everywhere um, on different product types. So uh, very much, um, dealing with the building code at a very in the trenches standpoint and it's, it's my job and my responsibility to get um, these buildings permitted um, and meet the vision and goal of our many nonprofit our partners who are trying to get people in housing as soon as possible and, and, and what I do is help facilitate that. That's great. Thank you so much uh, for for sharing that. So I, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as we start to talk about building codes. So I'd love to learn more about how the actual process of building codes comes about. And I really love that Pat brought the International Building Code book to show exactly how intense and how many codes there are. Uh, so when we get to individual cities, who writes these codes and who enforces them? And Perhaps, William, it's logical to start with you since you actually work for a city. Thank you. Um, for us, the uh, administration and enforcement of the building code is what we do. Uh, we don't write the building codes. And frankly, um, for the staffing that we have, and I know that we could get into this later, is that there are a, in uh, rural areas of the state, uh, we have difficulty in um, acquiring talent that has great experience and education in building codes. Uh, and in the construction industry, it's mostly hands-on learning uh, for folks in Douglas and Cochise County. Um, but what we find is that um, for us, we're looking really just at how to apply the code that we have, but it's a very standard kind of out of the box a uh, set of rules and regulations that are fairly opaque. Just as Pat showed you that large volume, uh, you know, our building, our new uh, building inspector and code enforcement officer, both of them have a, a, a bookshelf, uh, you know, set up with the, all the shelves filled with uh, building codes and associated uh, code family books. Uh, it's a lot of information to process, and um, we're doing our best to support their training. 
and continuing education so that they're better at doing it. But we're also trying to balance the needs of our community for a variety of housing types that aren't really even supported by our code. Um, so maybe we can talk a little more about that. But right now we're looking at how we might be able to uh, amend or append our building code to support uh, some of the innovative housing types that um, our zoning code is being amended right now to support, uh, to be in, uh, how do you say, to be in concert with our general plan, which calls for supporting a mix of housing types and opportunities, uh, compatible residential infill with a range of prices and housing products. Uh, this is something that we just don't uh, find in our current uh, development uh, process or our products that we we're getting. We're getting single family residential and pretty much just that. We're not getting tiny homes. We're not getting uh, container homes or accessory dwelling units uh, that are permitted, uh, but we have a lot of demand for it. It's, well, thanks for sharing that. It's great to hear about some of the innovation and thoughtfulness that's happening in Douglas. So as we've been talking about zoning reform a lot in Arizona, one of the things that had come to my mind was what's the difference between zoning reform and and getting rid of um, what's what's a fight about zoning and what's a fight about the building code? So can someone enlighten me and the other folks who are listening in about the difference between what comes down to zoning and what comes down to building code? Yeah, I can jump I, in. Oh, go ahead. We can all in, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as mentioned, zoning code is really, um, it, it pertains more to what an urban planning and what the planning staff views as what um, their community should be looking like and giving parameters um, such as setbacks, building heights and uses and laying out compatible uses and uh, levels of intensity across the, the cities to, to do that. So what that really does is it manages what can go where. So um, there's large swaths of our municipalities are designated for single family detached. So that means that that's the only thing that can get built. Um, and then there's areas that are designated for higher intensity multifamily, mixed use, commercial, and then that kind of guides what can be built. Um, and then provides parameters such as parking, setbacks, heights, as mentioned. What the building code does is says once that's all regardless of all of those rules, no matter what gets built, where it gets built, here's the set of rules that provides the life safety guidelines um, for whatever building gets placed. So for example, um, the taller a building gets, the more, the more time people need to get out of that building if there's a fire. So as a result, the building code says, the taller your building is, the more, um, systems need to be put in place um, to prov provide adequate time for people to get out of the building. So that, that means that a taller building will require sprinkler systems, it will require multiple exit ways, it will require emergency lighting, and um, it will require um, fire ratings along um, egress paths um, to get out of the building. That's really the number one thing um, that building code is built for is um, emergencies, so fires, earthquakes, and things like that. So making sure everyone can safely navigate their way out of a building in case of an emergency. And if there is um, some sort of catastrophic event, that the building stays standing um, through the process. So um, that's the way I describe it. It's once um, more about uses and the and the the um, where where those uses are designated to happen. And then the building code is is really goes down into the weeds on life safety. Thanks, Christian. And, and Pat and William, I think you both had things to share. So I don't know if you have other yeah. things that you'd like to add to that. Pat, would you like to go first? No, I think Christian said that very well. Um, zoning is what you can build and codes are how you can build it. I, I would like to add something to what Christian has said, which I think he hit it right on the nose. Um, but we have uh, with zoning, uh, it's making policy into law and taking our general plan 
policies and making regulations of, again, where you can do what and how much of it you can do. Um, but it's much more, uh, in my opinion, it's much more transparent and accessible um, in terms of decision-making and also for making amendments to it. Whereas the building code is something that, uh, you know, I've seen uh, some commentary that it's hard science. Um, I, you know, it, it depends on whose science is being applied, uh, but it's fairly opaque and behind a dark curtain that, uh, you know, if you really dig into the building code, it talks about uh, the minimum size of uh, certain types of uses and occupancy maximums, which if you've ever traveled to Europe, you see that these things are violated all the time uh, to the effect that there are wonderful places for people to gather that are in violation of our building codes. Um, and so I find that that's a really interesting question is if we're looking for vitality, uh, sometimes our building codes are actually those things that may prevent us from having those kinds of places. Again, risk and reward being you know, two ends of a spectrum. The zoning code is much more accessible for discussion of those things, whereas the building code is not. Um, but also just a, another thing that I'd like to touch on is that building codes often drive uh, the cost of projects. And it's not the zoning is not necessarily going to prevent a project from happening. It's going to be the building codes where we calculate per square foot uh, how much a value a project is. And it's location dependent. And the city can uh, adopt a fee schedule that's based on an older building code. Like we have the 2006 International Building Code that we've adopted. Um, and we have the, I think, original uh, fee schedule uh, and calculation for valuation, which is at $52 a square foot. Cochise County is at somewhere around $77 a square foot. And Sierra Vista is at $95 or $96 per square foot for a single family residence. And so the valuation of that project then drives the, the permit fees and those things are gonna be passed on to the customer. And that's what also, again, makes housing affordability a, a, a bit of a challenge. Those things that are not something that planning and zoning necessarily has any control over, but we're definitely the folks who are more accessible to the public in terms of answering to affordable housing issues. And, and William, I, I think I would have to respectfully disagree with your analysis that building code drives costs more than zoning. Um, zoning, um, really stops the conversation at step one, as opposed to building code, which might stop it at step 20. Um, zoning, you know, the conversations really stop at zoning. If there's a piece of dirt that someone wants to develop into affordable housing and the land use is not compliant, that's where the conversation ends. So there's never a point to say no, the conversation just never starts. It, you're um, not entirely wrong. You're not entirely wrong, Christian. It's just that with, with zoning, you know upfront what you can and can't do. If somebody gets started in a project and it ends up being an application of the building code that stops the project, that's where the frustration comes in because somebody's already sunk money into a project. They've already purchased the land. They've already gone through entitlements. And then suddenly there's something about their building and what they'd like to do that the building code is basically putting the block there. Yeah, but it, depends I, on the jurisdiction. It, it does depend on the jurisdiction. I mean, we're looking at being more flexible in Douglas. Not every place is like that. Um, so we're, we're looking at increasing uh, the availability of mixed uses and of tiny homes and uh, whether it's on fee simple lots or on multifamily zone lots or mixed use lots. We're, allow, we're wanting to allow for all of that in our zoning. So we are somewhat devolving our zoning from stopping the conversation. Um, but you're not, you're not wrong. There are jurisdictions where the, the zoning code basically says, yeah, you can't do any of this innovative housing. You can't do any of these projects. You can't do multifamily and all that. So I appreciate your, your I appreciate your disagreement. Pat, it looked like you might have something to say there too. I, I think I, I agree with both of you in a way. I, uh, the international building code this this really doesn't preclude the building of attainable or affordable housing, single family or multifamily. It's safety oriented, as Christian said, it keeps people safe. 
it, it's not that that's adding cost. It really is the stipulations that come with zoning. Th those are really, it's, and it's not even the enforcement so much, although the enforcement of the building code can be irritating and, and cause extra time, which we can get to. It, it really is the zoning and the stipulations that come with zoning. It's the parking requirements, the setback requirements, the exterior elevation requirements. It's those requirements that are within a city's individual zoning stipulations for us that 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 really prohibits building more that that is what's adding so much per square foot so it's it's zoning not the building code building code is is relatively easy to comply with and we should as builders Well, that's good to hear. And I'll I'll refer folks to a, a couple of previous webinar conversations that we had about zoning, because of course we could talk about we we can talk about zoning for 75 minutes because we've done it twice before. So I'll be sure to include links to those zoning conversations in the follow-up notes that everyone will receive. But I, I wanted to dig in a little bit more, uh, of course, to building code since that's what this webinar is all about and ask our panelists from their unique perspectives, what would you do to change the building code process to make it work better? And do you think that we need minor tweaks or a radical over overhaul of how things are done? And we got a couple of audience questions that kind of touched on this as well. Reed Butler asked, how do we significantly shrink the size of units? For example, how do you reduce bedroom sizes, minimum bedroom sizes, and how do you reduce or remove minimum parking requirements, which I know something that's something that Pat had already talked about. So what what do you all think? Do we need minor tweaks and what would those tweaks be or do we need a radical overhaul? What's your perspective? If I could, if I could answer that, I would say is that we really do need to look um, at our uh, our traditional uh, traditional communities and how they were built, and uh, without necessarily respect to the automobile um, as being the first uh, driver of site development and building development. So we're we're looking at basically in many ways tossing out our uh, parking regulations for all of our existing commercial areas because all of them are non-conforming with the development regulations or the zoning code that was adopted in 1966 here um we're you know the regulations call for walmart scale development or even just dollar general scale development and there aren't very many parcels in douglas that are actually capable of being built to that so we have to go through a variance process for all of those um most all of them and instead what we're looking to do is to adopt uh, mixed use uh, overlay regulations that would allow for the existing development that's there to be expanded, um, again, without any re regard to the parking requirements. We're just basically saying uh, park what you can. Otherwise, we're not looking to require you to have a minimum number of parking spaces for commercial space um, or for residential. We're trying to get away from that. You know, it's it's been a process, I think, for zoning reform for 20, 30 years since I began planning is to get away from that. And that's what we're trying to do here. At least in Douglas, we are. Yeah, going into um, the building code and um, what cities can be doing at that level, I think one of the biggest issues that there is, is there's definitely huge inconsistencies on interpretation of the code. So you have that book, it tells you exactly how things should be built, but that can be inter interpreted differently based on municipality. And even within a municipality, it can be interpreted differently within each staff member who's reviewing it. And then that's the plan reviewers. And then it goes to the field where you have building inspectors who then again, interpret that same code and may have a different opinion than what was approved by a plan reviewer um, in the planning department. Um, so an example of this is um, uh, there's a section in the code that um, describes uh, fire ratings um, for townhomes. So when you're building townhomes, um, you have to create a certain type of wall separating each unit. Um, so if one burns down or falls down for whatever reason, the other one should be able to stand up independently of the one next to it. So in one municipality, 
you can bear the structure directly onto that, that shared wall called a party wall. And um, there's a municipality right next to it where you cannot do that. They had interpreted the code saying that that's not allowed. And to not allow that is a significant cost increase and significant change in structural design. Still manageable, but it, it's not being able to use uh, the same standard building methodology really hampers the ability to get things done quickly and predictably. Um, and you'll you'll see that the more the more you get rid of that, and the more you consistent you consistency you have, the easier it is to build things in a, a more affordable way. And I really have to agree with that, Christian. That is one hundred percent what we deal with every day. I ha we have never had a set of permitted drawings from any city in Phoenix, uh, in in Arizona where we can go and build it to plan and not have an on-site inspector change a detail that was already approved in the permitting process because in the field that inspector has a different interpretation. We've also have different inspectors in different municipalities, like you said, looking at the same detail and wanting something different. We're just always chasing the next inspector's interpretation and the next guy in the field versus the last one that made the decision, backing up to go forward, backing up to go forward with no consistency. And it makes me wonder from a bigger perspective, if maybe individual municipalities like Douglas, individual municipalities should be charged with the zoning, but not building code. And if there were a larger agency, awful to say a state agency that provided, could permit a set of drawings and have all of the inspectors trained the same way to interpret it in the same methodology and then just spread out across the state, that may be a better solution if we could extricate that and not require the smaller municipalities, like William said, to go and find people to live in that community, to work in that community, then be, to then be trained, to then to go be inspectors. I think maybe the system needs a bigger overhaul and that might, that might be a solution. I, I love the innovative thinking and just uh, coming up with some different solutions. That's something I hadn't thought of before. So thanks for sharing that, Pat. I wanted to get back to both Pat and Christian and, and ask what happens to affordability and how this impacts affordable housing when you go through the code process and the designs have to change and you have to work with the different officials. What? How does that impact affordable housing? Well, it it makes it so much more expensive. The time, just you know, time is money, and what what could take six weeks is taking six months as you go through many many cycles of the of drawing, and then in the field, many many inspections. So that that in itself is just costing more money. Yeah, and I would say. Um... The way that the current building code is structured, um, it really limits what can be delivered as viable affordable housing solutions. Um, and I say that in, in the way, you know, when we're dealing with new technologies and processes like modular housing, 3D printing, when I use the metaphor of, of manufacturing a car. So, the the United States as a country has a minimum standard for what a car, a safe car, a fuel efficient car, a resilient car per se functions like, and, and they have no control over what it looks like, but it must function a certain way. And you can build a car in Nashville and ship it to anywhere in the country and sell it, except for maybe California where they have higher emissions requirements. Um, but um, so that that same process is not extended to buildings. So um, a car that a house that is built in Phoenix cannot be copied and pasted to Flagstaff, cannot be copied and pasted to um, California or to Utah or whatever. And what that does is it limits our ability to explore the modular and um, um, uh, 3D printed housing types that can deliver housing offsite to rural areas um, in a very cheap 
an inefficient, whatever efficient way. Um, and and I think you know you've got to picture this. If if a stud wall construction is works like in a factory, if you're building a car, you're putting it together. All these pieces need to come together, and they roll off the factory. And you know, a car costs you know twenty five to thirty five thousand um, dollars per car, and units are costing a housing unit costs five times that. You know, you're talking one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand per unit. Um, and the pieces can't be, they're so uninterchangeable because you can't, you don't have this consistent code that you can go to. So you can say, yeah, a unit that is safe and um, um, you can live in here in Phoenix, um, you can take that same thing and plop it down anywhere else. And you'll see a lot of our manufactured housing um, companies go out of business because of this process. The largest um, a uh, modular fact or manufacturer, Katera, um, could not handle this exact issue and they ended up going under and they were they were the largest ma uh, modular housing company um, with quite a bit, billions of dollars of investment and they just could not survive this process that's granted to automobiles but not ground granted to housing. And that that answer gets a little bit at least to the question that Mike Langley had asked about how any applicable building codes could impede or accelerate the development of 3D printed homes at scale around the state. Because, and he noted that Tempe has been a leader in housing innovations and is the location of the first 3D printed home for habitation in Arizona. I don't, I don't know if you have anything to add about that, but I wanted to make sure that I I mentioned his question and the first 3D printed home is it, for habitation is in Tempe. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Okay, yeah, well, I want I have thoughts well, on go it. ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, so with new technologies, it's that's where the building code, you hit a brick wall with the building code. An inspector has never inspected that before. They don't know how to inspect it. You have a building plan reviewer who's never seen that before. And um, Tempe was definitely, they were in the forefront because they were a lot of upfront conversations about what process was going to take place in order for this to happen. Um, you know, the technology, I think, is still 10 to 15 years out from being able to be a, um, a solution that actually pencils out um, for affordability um, and, and um, with the timelines as well, um, because framing really only replaces framing um, and framing is probably one of the easiest parts of building a house. Um, and um, framing is typically done with wood, which is a lot more sustainable of a material um, as opposed to concrete, which is among the worst for our environment to build out of concrete. So I'm hopeful that there's new fibers that come out that can be used for 3D printing that is not concrete. Um, but uh, that, that's my two cents on 3D printing. There's a long way to go on that and municipalities can play a role by being proactive and meeting with um, manufacturers that are, are using that technology to set up the processes. So, so when those, those product types do come um, uh, to the municipalities, they, they have, they're ready for them. Excellent point. Thanks for sharing, especially about the materials making a difference in 3D printing. So I want to turn it over to William and ask from a city perspective, can you, can you share what kind of power a building official has? How do they get appointed? What, and what kind of training and background do building officials need? And is there anything that's unique about your circumstances in, in Douglas that you think might also be applicable to other smaller communities in Arizona? I, I think it, at least speaking for Douglas that I echo the, the the desire that Christian's talking about with having some standards for innovation that could be applied generally. And as Pat also said, uh, but we sort of have a little bit of a challenge when it comes to folks who are trained uh, in our community to, to understand these types of uh, construction. and. We just brought on uh, two new staff people just within the last three three weeks, um, and they're not they're not certified officials, but we're working at getting them trained. And it's been my direction that they learn 
uh, all of these innovations as they're going along and not just to listen to our market who develops in Douglas, which is again, single family detached housing. And it's fairly standard, you know, the same plan that they wanna put in for each one of these things is that the community has been having a bit of a backlash towards very standard looking development. From my perspective, we just need to add housing of all types. And I want my staff to be able to accommodate that as they're looking at plans and as they're going out and doing inspections, that they're not stopping these things from happening, that they're coming to an understanding. But we don't yet have a construction industry in Douglas that is fluent or even learning, if, if I'm reading it right, as to how these kinds of housing would be appropriate for us. And I would like for that you know, conversation to continue and for whether it's uh, LISC uh, and some of the things that they're looking to do with training uh, and education at community college levels is for our local college, Cochise College to take in this kind of construction. Right now, all they're learning is single family residential, conventional, you know, um, housing. And we have the power to permit that. And generally speaking, we turn around our permits um, within a week if we have that time. But we're very, very loaded uh, in terms of our permit volumes uh, and the other planning and zoning work that I do. Um, so it's just a, a great challenge to, to get and then retain and train staff that would be qualified to take on these these new types of housing. So we're looking we're looking for help always, and we're looking to build capacity in our community to take on the future. But I'm also interested too about what Christian or Pat might have to say about um, natural building or hand built homes. In Cochise County, we have what's called an opt out program. It's a county uh, jurisdiction where they have four acres or more of land. Uh, zoned residential that they could build hand-built homes if they'd like, or put any kind of home that they would like with minimal uh, interface with the building code. But we have a building code and we can't necessarily throw that out, but I would definitely like for more flexibility. I would like to see that and have some you know, support in uh, making that kind of a transition. I hope that answers the question. It it does. Thanks, William. I just wanted to pause. I didn't know if Pat or Christian had anything to add. No. Uh, since you mentioned it, I wanted to invite David Longoria from Lisk Phoenix to join us on screen and talk a little bit more about the work that Lisk is doing on efficient and resilient codes. And you'd mentioned some of the workforce development training that they're looking to do. So I'll let David go ahead and explain some of some of what is in the works over at LISC Phoenix. Thanks, Serena. And thank you for moderating today's panel discussion. This is really a, a, a dynamic um, conversation. I really appreciate all the panelists for being here. Um, LISC Phoenix is currently part of a collective that's being led by the New Buildings Institute and the International Code Council in a uh, application to the Department of Energy. Uh, for a grant for resilient and efficient code implementation. And the application that we've submitted um, has to do around updating or helping, helping cities and towns steward updated building codes that reflect more of a Southwestern climate. Uh, and for LISC's part, what we are doing is we've authored the uh, community benefits plan in the application, uh, which we've received feedback very recently from the DOE that it's very strong. But our part would be um, actually doing the community engagement portion of it, which would be um, going into underserved communities within these cities and towns, learning from them about some of the issues that they are facing with respect to existing and aging infrastructure, uh, both residential and commercial, um, but also educating them on what it means to update building codes that are more resilient and efficient for uh, from a sustainability perspective and what it means in terms of retrofitting uh, those existing uh, structures. In addition to that, uh, Serena, as you mentioned, uh, we would also be leading the effort on a workforce development uh, portion of this uh, work, uh, which would involve partnering so far with three um, community colleges around Arizona, Coconino up north, 
uh, gateway here in the Phoenix metro area and Pima Community College down in Tucson to update their existing curricula to uh, more reflect the uh, updated uh, building codes and how we can train a new workforce uh, in the trades uh, to that that will reflect these uh, new uh, building codes going forward. So we're very excited about this application. We should be hearing as early as next month as to whether or not we'll get funded. And if we do, uh, we would get started on this project um, as soon as uh, this fall. Uh, it's a four-year project, and we're very excited uh, about it. So um, I'm happy to share my contact information as well. I'll drop that in the chat if any of uh, our uh, audience or participants want to discuss this more. And judging from the chat so far, uh, we really should have had Ryan Stevenson on this panel. My goodness. Uh, Ryan's an old friend, and I just want to shout out to him. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of this. And again, thank you to the panelists on behalf of Liz Phoenix and the uh, Arizona Partnership for Health Communities. Thanks, Stephen. And, and yes, thank you to Ryan and everyone else who have, has been participating in the chat because they think that that's one of the most valuable parts of these discussions is having this kind of robust chat. And we will share the links that people are putting in the chat and the follow up email. And also the chat is available along with the recording after. So if there are things that are happening in the chat and it is happening rapidly, so it's hard to keep up you can always revisit that. I know that there's been a lot of interest in uh, what William was talking about with hand-built uh, communities. And I think you had some images. Uh, well, I know you had some images, so I, I'll go ahead and bring it back over to you and I'll bring those images up on screen if you wanna talk about them. Sure, I would love to. So we have a, a great number of historic vintage um, buildings in our town. This first is uh, the Avenue Hotel. And uh, it was built in the very early 1900s and is built with uh, Adobe construction. Um, the building needs some repairs as I understand it, um, but it's definitely a building that doesn't really fit uh, with our building code. You know, our building code doesn't have, unless we really take a serious look at how we apply our existing building code, depending on who the building uh, inspector or building official is, we could have some challenges. Thankfully, we have new staff who, as again, I'd said, we're definitely wanting to encourage preservation of these buildings, but I'd also like to see new Adobe construction available as well, because it can be a very uh, affordable form of housing construction, um, but it's definitely not something that's conventional and I don't know if it's supported by the building code at all. The next is, uh, one of our um, early, it's just a small home. It's a, about 600 square feet, um, likely doesn't meet our building codes uh, for size, uh, but it's right here in our downtown. Uh, fortunately, um, you know, it's pr protected in the historic preservation overlay zoning district, which uh, allows for a variety of uses, a wide variety of uses, but also without limitations on the size. So the size really just comes down to what does the building code say? The next image um, I'd like to show is uh, a, a Colonia housing. This is a very common form of housing in Douglas that was built uh, by hand by the people who occupied these spaces as employees of Phelps Dodge uh, Mining Company when this was a, an early smelter town uh, where you know, we were known as the Copper Kings. And we had so many people moving from Mexico and Sonora, right? You know, we're like right at the border with Agua Prieta. Many of these people uh, who are Douglasians now uh, originally came from uh, Agua Prieta and these were their homes. This is like the earliest form of housing we had in Douglas. And we're finding a lot of people who are interested in buying them and tearing them down. We're generally discouraging that, but our building code doesn't necessarily support that either. And last, um, this building here is a residential multifamily. Um, and for many varieties of reasons, it's probably not meeting any building code, probably not even meeting our zoning code. Uh, it's got an arcade that goes over the sidewalk uh, with housing up above. Uh, very interesting and something that I look at and I find it very charming. It may need a little bit of TLC and repair, but it's a, to me, it's a beautiful building and it provides a lot of options for housing. 
I would like to see more of this. And I'm, again, looking at our zoning code and amendments of it to allow for housing like this to come back to Douglas. But we would need to have a construction industry that supports it. We need to have people who actually know how to do this and make these places uh, again in other vacant lots, which we have still very many, uh, and in areas where we have significantly zoned mobile home residential, we don't see any mobile homes coming in because you know the mobile home and manufactured housing, our zoning is very restrictive with that as to what kind of housing can go on these zones. We're trying to open that up as well with the overlay to allow for a variety of innovative housing types. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you for sharing. I love the connection there uh, to just looking back to our history to see what kind of multifamily housing options uh, we, we already have in our communities. And I think that's uh, just really inspiring. So I really appreciate you taking the time to take the pictures and share them with everyone. Um, Pat and Christian, I don't know if you had uh, some things that uh, you wanted to say, it's, but I wanted to give you a chance to hop in there. I just wanted to congratulate William on on what he's doing in Douglas and the, and the way you look at the the inventory that's already there and how you can keep it and how you can possibly do adaptive reuse and how you guys are open to, to changing the current restrictions so that you can build on these smaller lots in Phil and build different types of homes. I, th I think it's great what you're doing. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Pat, I know you also have some images, so maybe this is a good time to share some of the images that uh, Greenlight Communities uh, has and some of the work that you're uh, building as well. Absolutely, I mean, we do something completely different. We, we build new uh, in the work that we did, the research and development that we did in finding a solution for workforce housing and building it on a large scale and really providing a lot of units in a market that really needs it. We, look at, we looked at what the least expansive building type was for density and it's three-story wood frame and i think as christian alluded to it's it's the most inexpensive building type um one of the most sustainable building types we build three-story wood frame buildings with with on-grade parking smaller units studios ones and twos and it's focused it's it's workforce it's entry level it's meant for people that are earning 60 to 100 percent of ami so the minimum wage can, can rent a studio here. It's all new construction. It's all to building code. And it's about 250 units per project. And we have about 5,000 units in the pipeline under construction or in development. You can see it all looks very similar. Uh, everything looks similar. So we've gone through all of the cities to build that. That's the, uh, she's, uh, Serena's showing the exterior. And it's interior facing, and Serena can put up the slides of the interior. So it's interior facing. We believe that that ability to share that interior courtyard with your neighbors, it, it just, it provides more of a community for people to enjoy. We put in community gardens, we put in outdoor fitness. We really try to encourage community in our buildings and really encourage neighbors to get to know one another and to enjoy the spaces, inward looking versus outward looking and, uh, and very efficiently built. I think there's one more slide that would be just EV car charging, bike storage, fitness, uh, everything that we, we took the Ace Hotel concept, everything that you need, nothing that you don't designing these so very different from your luxury apartment buildings that you that you may see out in your market. Christian, I know you probably designed some of them. Serena, you've seen them. I think people on the panel have seen the large luxury part apartments. That's not what we are. We're, we're entry-level workforce housing. And one thing I would say, uh, I think Serena, to answer one of your earlier questions, what can cities do? Our experience is that cities treat entry-level affordable workforce housing the same way they treat a luxury building. So we're on the same timeline. I would ask anybody that's with a city, what would help us build more is just put us first in the queue. Can we queue jump if we're building attainable rental product? Can we, can we get some kind of priority both in the inspection process and in the permitting process? 
that would be tremendously helpful to shrink that six or seven months to get entitlement down to three or four. That that's something quick that could that could happen that would put more attainable housing uh, in your communities. Thanks so much for sharing and you, both both your possible solutions and the uh, the communities that Greenlight are is building right now. So thank you for for all of that. Um, I wanted to uh, circle back to the conversations around building codes now that we've seen some of the examples, both from our history and current buildings that that Greenlight is building. I, I'm curious how these building codes that you all have to deal with in different ways impact affordable housing and what what kind of instances of specific code requirements enforced on attainable and affordable apartments that don't increase safety but do increase costs and timing and we talked a little bit about that but since this is about affordable housing and we're in a crisis moment in Arizona I wanted to make sure that we we get back to that and I'll, I'll jump in. I think the big one for us is parking requirements. And it was either Christian or William that talked about it. The parking requirements are out of sync with the requirements of the residents that are going to live there. And parking requirements, huge fields of parking requirements that just become this heat desert over time that can be mostly empty because we have fewer cars. And in urban infill locations, there are just fewer cars. But parking for me if there were if there was relief in parking it would allow more density therefore less expensive um, product can be delivered into the market setbacks the same thing some of the larger setback requirements prohibit density and um uh that, that those are the two big things setbacks and parking requirements i think that could really impact what we do yeah and i'll point to um um, flexibility with building plan review and the building officials and the inspectors. Um, I will highlight the city of Mesa, their building official and um, building department is among the easiest in the entire state to work with that I've worked with personally. Um, they understand kind of that there's an intent to the code and there's some leeway for interpretation. Um, so there was a case where we were able to very quickly within a week um, apply for a building code modification because we were restricted on height um, by the zoning um, or, or actually by the building code and the zoning in this instance did not restrict us on height, um, but we needed to maintain a um, um, it was actually a combination of things that the ground floor needed to be really tall and then the um, which caused the, all the housing on top to be really tiny, which is obviously not good. We don't, we want a lot of daylight in, in our, in our units. We want all of that, the good things that come with higher ceilings. Um, so those two things were at conflict. So we asked for a code modification to allow our, our, our building to be taller from a code standpoint. So, um, and code does limit how tall a building can be based on what it's made out of. So a wooden building can only be as high as um, four stories if it's um, <clears throat> untreated wood, and it can go higher if it's treated wood and mass timber wood. But the code sets that on its own. Um, and then if it's concrete and steel, it can go even taller because it's less likely to catch fire, less, less, less likely to fall down, less likely to fail over time. Um, and of course, that's to this the code that you're seeing today. This is not speaking to the code from the 60s and 70s when you see buildings falling down. That's very different um, than the building codes today, which we're, are, are very, very much um, in line with safety. And you don't see buildings that were built 20 years ago um, falling over. You don't see them catching fire because they have such advanced fire suppression systems and fire alarm systems that these kinds of accidents don't happen to buildings that were built recently within the last two decades um, that you see with buildings that were built, you know, in the 60s and 70s when, you know, there wasn't fire sprinkler requirements, there wasn't a uniform code um, at the time, so. Uh, 
I wanted to get to one of the questions that we had just come to the panelists and it was while Pat was showing those wonderful images of the green light communities. And Barbara had asked us what kind of um, neighborhood pushback green light has been, if there is any pushback. And I also wanted to have each of us, each of the panelists answer what kind of process they think would be ideal to allow for flexibility, because you all have suggested some really interesting and innovative housing solutions. How do you allow for that flexibility while still working with the community and recognizing what the community wants? Uh, we, we do get pushback. And it's one of the things about my job and development that saddens me the most is the pushback that we get from neighborhoods um, that just want to pull up the ladder after they're there. They're there, they don't want anybody else there. And in the, I've been doing this since 1996, and I see that trend just magnifying and magnifying, getting, getting worse and worse, the pushback from neighbors not wanting, I'll use air quotes, those people uh, living in their communities. It's very strong. We, uh, 1996, we would deal with the, the neighbors, the people that lived in the neighborhood, and now there's coalitions of people that live in different municipalities, different cities, different states that all get together and, and can push, can provide pushbacks. So it's not even necessarily the neighbors that we're dealing with. I've noticed that trend. I've also noticed a trend that the it's the vocal minority. It's two, it's two or three neighbors that may or may not represent the, the larger communities, don't know, but their voices are the ones that are being heard. The pushback is very significant. Uh, renters cause crime, renters cause traffic, uh, renters put more kids in the schools, renters use the park, uh, and, and the entry-level renters are, are the worst. And it's just so sad and so heartbreaking to hear that we don't want our teachers and our barista from Starbucks and our Amazon driver living in the in the community or living next door to us. It's something that's very, It's we've almost stopped, shut down our business several times after one of these neighborhood meetings and said, why are we trying to do this? People just don't, communities just don't want it, but but we persevere. So yes, lots of pushback. And I'll echo what Pat said uh, with a bullhorn, uh, a little bit surprised knowing that uh, we're in a housing crisis here, even in Douglas, where our economics are probably tend towards the low end. We have a high poverty rate here. Uh, we have a high demand for housing. We have um, a somewhat transient population uh, in terms of our employment with uh, border protection, having such a large presence here as a border crossing town. Um, where people want to rent. They live in Texas. They move here for three years. They don't want to sell their house in Texas. They just want a place to live while they're in, working in Douglas. And it's such a challenge. Uh, whenever we do have a public process, typically it's zoning, a zoning question, where even where policy supports uh, multifamily housing, mixed use in an area of town, that is already served by uh, the space available for commercial development. It's already commercial development from the 60s or maybe 70s that's here that needs to have more population nearby. We had a proposal for multifamily residential zoning and staff easily supported it. And all it took was two neighbors, uh, actually not even neighbors, just two people in the community who had a, an ax to grind with a developer who was proposing the rezone and they brought out all of their friends. And so we had this vocal minority, many of them who didn't even live within the notification area for that proposal. And that pretty much put things on a downslope. Our planning and zoning commission recommended denial just because of that, that vocal minority. It's just, it's very, it's very frustrating because this is exactly the kind of housing we need. And even still, the, you know, we need more than what the developer actually wanted to propose, which was duplexes. We would be happy with some of the prod, you know, at least staff, uh, happy with the product that, that Pat showed us. You know, we need to have 20,000 population in Douglas, where we have currently about 15 to 16,000 in order to attract and keep a grocery tenant, which would be right across the street in this space that was a grocery store. And it's just, it's disheartening, really, 
that we have that kind of opposition. Um, but we're still pushing forward to provide opportunities uh, from the planning and zoning. And we also, again, want to make sure our zoning, our building code aligns with that too. But yeah, it, it was my first real run in with here's an opposition that's going to be vocal and doesn't matter how rational it is. Uh, it, those people, that, that kind of language was used, renters, of which I'm a renter, uh, you know, I, I mean, direct offense, uh, but we we're being told that there are uh, illegal immigrants crossing the border and using our schools, using our spaces, our parks. Uh, I mean, pretty much everything Pat said, I was like, I heard this at the public hearing back in March, you know? Um, so I, I don't know how we, how we, I don't want us to lose our power to uh, improve our community in a way that's appropriate for Douglas. But at the same time, uh, some of those teeth that we're getting don't really, shouldn't even have gums uh, to be set in. And that, yet there they are. Really, really good points. And I, am really appreciative of the conversation happening in the chat as well. I, I think this is a frustration that many of us share and that we're all trying to work through together. And I, I really also wanted to come back to a question that we got in the chat about the water crisis. Helen had asked, does the water in crisis impact building? And I'd love to know if there's any sort of um, it, part of the building code that recognizes the need for, for water and how our impending water crisis and our housing crisis might intersect. And if that's something that, uh, that you all think about being in the lines of work that you do. Yeah, I think they go hand in hand. You, you can't, you obviously can't help house people without the water to do so. I think what, there's a common misconception about the role that housing plays in, in our um, addressing climate change and our water crisis. Um, and really the answer is, um, there was this case study done, like what, what is the most influential thing a municipality can do to reduce the carbon footprint um, of, e of each resident in their, in their community? And the answer, by and large was um, allow for infill housing. And this goes along the trend of dense housing and compact housing being good for the environment. So um, when you're talking about water, you, you gotta think about where most of that water use goes. It goes outside, it goes to water, water yards and things like that. And when you build denser, you build more tightly, you're able to eliminate a lot of that you know, as picture 100 homes, 100 single family homes, and the amount of land that's going to take up, the amount of landscape that's going to take up versus a more compact, let's say four or five story, um, um, 100 unit apartment complex, which will take up a lot less land, require a lot less water, um, and then end up in, in you, when you're talking about infill housing, you're talking about building that within a place where the infrastructure for the water already exists. So you're just tapping into existing infrastructure as, as opposed to sprawling, where you're building new infrastructure, you're impacting what's called greenfield or untouched land. Um, that, that's what we wanna move away from. We wanna to move towards building up within our, our existing infrastructure and utilizing it and maximizing it um, so that we're providing um, not only housing for more people, but also doing it in a way that's more sustainable. So you have organizations like Sierra Club of, of nationally, and you have organizations or, or people like Bill McKinnon, who's a really famous um, um, environmentalist who are pushing for that kind of development and the role that building new housing can have in tackling the water crisis and the, house, and, and the climate crisis. Thanks, Christian, for sharing your thoughts there. William or Pat, I don't know if you wanted to. Yep, I see you unmuted, William. Go ahead. Just to 
I, I would like to tag on to that is that uh, we and Douglas are uh, at the edge of that water crisis, but none of our builders, I think, really think about it. They just look at uh, what their bottom line is for connecting a you know a water meter to their uh, to their project and what the impact fees are going to be. Uh, but I really do think the big picture we need to figure out how we can better use the water that we get. Um, our water table is a precious resource. We just I think in the last year had an AMA, uh, I think it's an aquifer management area uh, designated. Uh, not a lot of people are happy about that, uh, though, especially farmers that are up to the north of us. But uh, we need to find ways of reusing uh, gray water. You know, we need to find ways if, if the building codes need to be, if the plumbing codes, the build, you know, any of that stuff, we need to have the, the machinery in our codes to allow that to happen. Uh, and yes, science-based, Ryan, we need it to be science-based, but we need to actually be looking at it seriously and right now uh, for how we could reuse rainwater, how the water from our sink goes to the laundry area, then goes to the toilet, and then can go you know, into the sewer system or even into a composting uh, situation outside. Any number of things that we can do to be, make better use of our water. You know, If we can't change our behavior patterns, is figure out how we can maximize the efficiency of use of a precious resource, which is drinking water. But we use it for everything, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me when we're in such a challenging time. Really good points, especially if building codes are supposed to be about protecting the health and safety of the people that live there. What what could be more about more more relevant to health and safety than ensuring that we have access to water. And I, I think that I, I just really appreciate the question. So thanks, Helen, for bringing that up. And thank you uh, for your thoughtful answers. We are starting to wind down. We're coming to our the close to, close to the close of our webinar. And I just wanted to make sure that each of the panelists had a few minutes, a couple minutes to say how uh, to share any final thoughts to address how if they had a magic wand to wave what they might do to change any sort of uh, building code process or the code itself. And I am just going to say thank you to William Osborne from Douglas, Arizona, to Christian Solario from the architectural resource team, and to Pat Watts from Greenlight Communities for sharing their insight and wisdom today. And I also really want to thank the Arizona Housing Coalition for being such an excellent partner in these webinars. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for being here, for caring about these important topics, for caring about affordable housing and the health of our communities, and for participating so robustly in the chat, because that's what makes these webinars fun. And I am sure that we will have more coming up. And I, I look forward to our next conversation. So if there are are other conversations that you think we need to be having, please don't hesitate to reach out. But I will go ahead and turn it over to our panelists for their final thoughts. And I don't know, it, it, William, maybe I will start with you since you are already unmuted. So it, the floor is yours. What I look, what I look to with the magic wand is um, education, um, of, especially of our youth you know, in schools right now. We need to be preparing them for this future of, of being water challenged, of needing to go into green building, needing affordable housing, uh, needing to have somebody that can design projects and have people that can understand those designs and allow for this to happen. I had a brief conversation with uh, Nolan Gray, author of Arbitrary Lines a few months ago, and we had a discussion about this, about this topic, but also about uh, what comes after? So if we get rid of zoning or we like seriously uh, toss it aside, what is it that replaces it in terms of community value and quality of design of the environment? Most of the regulation or the legislation that we've seen uh, coming to Arizona, it just talks about more single family housing, more multifamily housing, just allow it. But there's nothing that talks about the affordability uh, part of the equation. At the same time, there's nothing really discussing how we can improve planning, uh, using planning more than we use zoning. And that's what Nolan suggested is that we just need to reframe the discussion. And when I think about that, 
to me, it means we need to really look at form-based codes where we as planners and even as like officials working for a city or a jurisdiction, we're looking for the outcome. We want to see a certain something, but how that gets done, allow for some flexibility and creativity in that. Uh, but, you know, we want to see more development. We want to see more residential. We want to see more mixed use. Our regulations should encourage that because our plan wants us to have that. And so that's my thought is just we need to be educating our youth for the future and supporting the idea that maybe you don't just subtract zoning. You also have to look at plus planning, making it more about the outcomes that your community wants to see and then standing back and letting the professionals like Christian and Pat provide those solutions or in certain uh, situations, letting the people themselves provide the solution, letting them build their stuff by hand, recognizing that it's on them if things go wrong, right? But the public health, safety, and general welfare isn't always going to be the same for everyone. Thank you so much. And thank thanks for, for mentioning all of those solutions and and for as one, one uh, participant just put it, your ideas and your enthusiasm. So thank you for that. Pat, I'll go ahead and turn it to you for your final thoughts. Oh, thank you, Serena. This has been fabulous, by the way. I loved it. Uh, love talking to William and Christian and all of the chat on the side. It's hard to pay attention to what's going on the screen because I'm reading the chat at the same time. But I think my takeaways for the sit for everyone that works for a city that's that's in the chat online is to find a way to interpret the building code consistently across jurisdictions to find a way to allow builders to build for permitted plans without making field changes and to find a way to attainable, affordable housing that you want in your communities to fast track that through the process and slow track what you don't want and fast track that. And lastly, we talked about NIMBYs and people standing up and like William said, get you know two or three neighbors can stop things. If you want something in your community and you believe it should be there, that you need to make your voice heard and people that want infill, that want density, that want the kind of development we're talking about, the way to have elected officials do what you want is to go to the meetings and make your voice heard and not just let the NIMBYs, the two people that William said, carry the day. Uh, so get out there and support it vocally. Thank you, Pat. And Christian, you get to wrap us up. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. No, I think Pat hit on a lot of the things I was going to talk about. So I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit and just talk about the housing crisis in general. You know, we're, we're facing a shortage. You see some numbers as high as 270,000 units that are needed. And a lot of that is on the lower end of the income spectrum. And one thing I want to make clear to everyone is that there's not a world in which we subsidize our way out of this crisis. We cannot do that. Um, we are looking at a record $230 million investment to housing homelessness this year as a state. And in order to get us out of the hole that we're into, it would take us over 300 years of consistent funding of that same $230 million every year for 230 years to subsidize our way out of this um, um, out of this issue. And the reason I mention that is because most of our people who are low income, who are struggling, who are, who are working, working, working hard, minimum wage jobs, whatever it is, they're living somewhere. And most of them are not living in subsidized units. They're living in naturally affordable housing. They're living in mobile homes, manufactured housing, low density apartments, they're living, they're living these things that are much, much, much harder to build today. And what we need to do is leave no stone unturned and really try to roll back all of these restrictions that have prevented this from happening over the last 40 years where we haven't seen new mobile home parks in, in a lot of municipalities. We haven't seen manufactured housing be allowed. Um, that's the, the things that we need to do because we need to, yes, provide uh, funding for subsidized units and to provide that stability that's transformative, which is the work that I do professionally, but we need to do that. We also need to go outside of that and really unlock folks like Pat and the work that they do where they're not using sub, sub, subsidized or, or federal funding or anything like that. And they're pro providing housing for our teachers, for our firefighters and for um, our grocery store workers. 
Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you for highlighting what a an important moment this is and how much work we all have to do to uh, to really address this housing affordability crisis that we're in. On behalf of the Arizona Partnership for Healthy Communities, the Arizona Housing Coalition and LISC Phoenix, I just wanted to thank these three amazing panelists so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you all for joining this conversation. We'll be sending out a recording and links that were shared in the chat to you all this week. And I just am really appreciative that we are able to have this conversation about how we can keep people safe with building codes and also remove the red tape that prevents affordable housing from being built. And thank you all for your great questions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.